So this morning, I want to share from a scripture that I, I worked through during the past week, and I think it really ties well in with what Vanna shared this morning and what we sang this morning, and it's, uh, yeah, it's from Acts chapter 9. Now, what happened in Acts chapter 9? If it's, if it's up there, what's ha what happened in Acts chapter 9? Something significant happened there. Luke is writing and he's telling us something significant that happened in the early church. Show of hands. Acts chapter 9. Come on. Acts chapter 9. There is a chapter 9 in the book of Acts. I'm also very concerned. Can I ask that question again? Who knows what hermeneutics is? We're going to have to do Bible school about the interpretation of scripture and it's really really important but uh, we will get back to that one thank you for vanner for uh, for sharing that one acts chapter 9 is where a man with the name saul came became radically saved so uh, that is a, is a, a significant um, text for us to study and i just fell in love with it in a sense it's a very theologically rich um, chapter in the New Testament, and Luke wrote it down in the book of Acts, and Luke actually recorded Paul's testimony of his salvation and the encounter with the Lord Jesus three times, in Acts chapter 9 for the first time, and then also in chapter um, 22 and 26, you can go and read it, and every time there's a little bit more information or a little bit more detail or background, so uh, you can go and have a look, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 26, the last two times, it's actually where Paul is speaking himself. He's uh, defending him, himself. Um, please go and read that. I'm not going to read that um, today. But uh, So before we continue, let's have a look. This man, um, this man Saul, or Paul, um, Saul was actually his Hebrew name. Paul was his Roman name. And uh, I will tell you just now, if there's some confusion on who he really is, there's a scripture that really points it out beautifully. Um, or let me do that first in Acts chapter 13. So you will meet him, Saul, or actually he's, uh, he's mentioned before that, indirectly um, Luke refers to him with the stoning of Stephen. He was actually standing close by, people were putting their garments at his feet, young man, and uh, then in chapter 9, we actually get to meet Saul. And then as you probably know, later on um, in, the, in the book of Acts, he's referred to as Paul as he continues into the Gentile world, if I can put it like that. He uses or he's referred to in terms of his Roman name, Paul. And we know him very well as Paul the Apostle. Many, many books written by him. And in Acts chapter 13, verse 9, it says, But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, look intently at him, and you can go and read the rest of the verse there. So we meet him as Saul in terms of his Hebrew name, that's the way that God spoke to him the first time, and then later on, um, as he starts his, his mission to the Gentiles, um, his, his Roman name was used, and that is Paul, and that's how we refer. So if I interchange the names Saul and Paul, we are actually referring to exactly the same person. Okay. Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 19, um, Corne Becker told us if we read, read anything less than a chapter on a Sunday in church, we should close the church down, so I don't want the church to close, so uh, I'm going to read at least from um, Acts chapter 9, from verse 1 to 19, that's just tongue in the cheek, he didn't say it in that specific way, but he encouraged us to read scripture. And uh, I believe it's something that we really stand for. So it will be on the board. You can follow um, or in your Bible or on one of your apps. So Acts chapter 9 verse 1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told 
um, and you will be told what you are to do. The men, um, the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So, that, so they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now they, in verse 10, now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. We've got also Ananias in our church. I don't see him here this morning. I saw him yesterday. But we've got also Ananias. This is a different Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Verse 13, But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all um, who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord the, um, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then, then, he, then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed, Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon the name? And he has not, um, and has he not came here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Okay, so this is the first time that we see this testimony um, of, of, of Saul's conversion here in the book of Acts. And uh, I want us to, to walk a little bit and to, to study this text together in a sense this morning and to, to see what, um, what Luke wants us to see. So Luke starts off, Luke obviously wrote the gospel according to Luke, and he wrote the, um, um, the book of Acts, giving us very, very good insight into the early church and the spreading of the gospel and how the spirit was poured out for the first time there in the book of Acts and how the church grew from, from firstly from the, um, the Jews and went to the Gentiles and how it was spreading to the nations in many ways. So he starts off and he says, but Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Now this is an idiomatic expression. He wasn't literally breathing that out, but it's a way of referring to Saul's hatred for the church. Remember, there was a deep hatred. Saul stood by when, when, when um, Stephen was stoned. He approved of that. And the garments of some of the people were laid at his feet. So he had no problem um, with what happened a little bit earlier in the book of Acts. And here it, Luke makes it clear that he hated the church. And he asked, um, so he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, that he will bring them bound. Now, I, I love the way, uh, the, in, a few times in the book of Acts, that, that this referred to the church as followers of the way. It always makes me think of what we learned as, as young children, the Breeweg and the Smallweg, you know, the broad way and the narrow way, and that we need to be on the right way in that sense. And here we see 
um, something interesting or significant. Um, Saul was actually quite a young man um, at this stage. He actually had access to the high priest, which is something that wasn't normal for a young man in many ways. But if we do a little bit background study and we dig a little bit deeper, that is called exegesis. When we look into the text and we read a little bit about the culture and the, the tradition and uh, the things surrounding um, that specific time period, it helps us to give us a little bit a deeper understanding. We would see that Paul actually came from a above average wealthy family, that he had was actually a very good upbringing and a very good ex um, education. Um, his Greek was excellent, so uh, he had a very good teacher in the man named Gamaliel, and uh, you know he was full of zeal and full of passion, and he excelled at a young age, and therefore he had access to the high priest, and the high priest obviously gave him letters um, of, of consent or uh, to approve and to say, you can go to the various synagogues, and if you find those ways, well, bring them up bound. Um, so that that's just speaks of his um, yeah, of his heart and his hatred towards the church and towards believers. Now we would see he went. It's something uh, Luke says that he went to the high priest. So it was a conviction in his heart, and uh, we would see this same determination that that Saul had to travel to Damascus and capture, if I can call it like that. Um, Christians and bring them bound, the Lord would use that same zeal for him to become a missionary. Saul went on three amazing missionary trips, if we count. Um, the fourth one would be the one to Rome, um, the last one in that sense. But, but Saul was a guy that when he was born again and saved and filled with the Spirit of the Lord, and when he was a changed man, he also went on mission trips, not to persecute the church, to build the church. He laid down his life for that purpose in many ways. So, um, yeah, so he went to that. And uh, then we see in, in this next uh, portion, we see, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. Now, this is a this key moment what, what uh, Luke wants us to see because it's everything to do with Paul's salvation. It's also an example of sola gratia, um, saved by grace alone. We can see Paul was on his way persecuting the church. There's no indication that it, you are searching for the Lord Jesus Christ. It is something that God or Jesus did sovereignly. That was also one of the battle cries, the five battle cries during the Revelation. You know, that salvation is through grace alone. It was the power of God at work. This wasn't a soul thing. It is something that Jesus wanted to do in this specifically called man's heart right here. If we go and we just um, read a little bit, and I will just want to, um, I'm not going to read um, chapter 22 and 26 where he's, um, the same uh, testimony is recorded by Luke. I just want to briefly read from verse 26, um, you know, to give us a little bit background what the Lord wanted to do in Saul's life. It says there in chapter 26, But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things in which you have seen me and, and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes, so that, may so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Isn't that just the beautiful um, words that he used? From darkness to light, from the power of Satan into the kingdom of God. Saul, that is why I am appearing to you. That is why my light is shining on you. And this is why you are having a significant Jesus encounter right now. Yeah. Then we see, Luke says, um, he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So we can understand if you are persecuting the church, you are persecuting Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is the head of the church. So what you do to the church, you do that to Jesus Christ as well. 
Paul's response or Saul's response as he, he answered with a question and he said, Who are you, Lord? And, and he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now we can see right there, Luke understood right there in Genesis chapter 1, God said, let the light shine. Okay? In, John, in, in John chapter 1, we see that, um, um, what was his name? John the Baptist, he came to bear witness about the light that was to come. That is Jesus Christ. And here we see this theme of light once again, the light shining here right on the soul. It's falling to the ground. It's, a, it's something that, uh, well, sometimes I guess some of us could experience something similar, but this was something significantly that was recorded. Now, for Saul, remember, he knew the Old Testament very well. He was a Pharisee, and uh, he studied it, so he had good theology, um, except that Jesus Christ was outside of that at that stage. So when this whole thing happened, he must have known, because he was a, in that sense a believing man in God, that it must be God or an angel speaking to him. But do you notice he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't um, recognize um, Jesus' voice. He doesn't say, um, Lord Jesus, or something. He, said, um, he answered and he said, Who are you, Lord? He knew about God and he knew about all the things of the Old Testament. But his response is very clear. Who are you, Lord? And then Jesus says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So, something I want to make clear and I'll, I'll end off with that was, at that stage, Saul, the man Saul that became Paul later, as we know, had no revelation of Jesus Christ. Did he know about Jesus Christ? He definitely knew a lot about Jesus Christ. He hated his guts in a sense. He was persecuting the believers because they, they called on the name of Jesus. Okay? He heard these stories and as he interrogated people probably, as he bound them up, as he threw them in jail, they, he was probably asking them, how could you believe this heresy, etc. You know? So, and right here, he encounters the living Jesus Christ himself. Something that is very interesting for us as the church, Jesus said in John chapter 10, that his sheep will hear his voice. And here we can see um, Saul answered and said, Lord, who are you? But a little bit later on in, in verse 10, we see when the Lord spoke to Ananias, just look at the different response. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a, in, in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. He immediately recognized the voice of the Lord, where Saul was like, who's speaking to me? Okay, but That was something just beautiful um, as I read it that I noticed. Now, the Lord Jesus didn't rebuke um, Saul at that stage for asking the question, who are you? Okay, He explained to him and said, I am Jesus Christ. So Paul knew about the followers of Jesus. He knew about the church. That's the reason why he went to the high priest to get the letters, traveling to Damascus, see if he can, can find some of these followers of the way, the Jesus people. And uh, right here, the Lord said, well, that's that beautiful thing that Paul writes in Ephesians, that before the foundations of the world, Saul, so I had my eyes on you. I had a purpose for you. I've got a calling for you. And today, this thing of persecuting my church is going to stop. And you will proclaim my name later on. Um, we will see that. Then verse 10 to verse, um, verse, 10 to verse 19, I'm just going to briefly um, have a look up, uh, regarding that portion. And that is basically where the Lord spoke to Ananias. And he instructed him what he had to do. We see that Ananias recognized the, the voice of the Lord, um, etc. So I'm just going to briefly look at one or two things. Uh, you can go and read verse 10 to 19 at home as well. But we see Jesus himself parallel to Paul's salvation. He already, and that's just the beauty of our sovereign Lord Jesus Christ. So parallel to Saul's conversion, he also spoke. To Ananias, and he said to Ananias, 
um, well, Ananias immediately recognized the voice of Jesus, but there was fear in the heart of Ananias. Okay, so the Lord gave him an assignment, but there was fear in his heart because he knew this man Saul was a dangerous man. Okay, he was persecuting the church. And there's probably something for us in that as well, where the Lord might call you to do something, lead somewhere, say something, and we might feel afraid because Ananias said, he, he actually he, he shared his heart with the Lord and said, Lord, but I'm afraid of this man. And the Lord said, but I've got a plan with this man's soul. And then we beautifully see how Ananias obeyed the instruction that the Lord Jesus has given to him. We also see that he laid hands on Saul and confirmed that Jesus appeared to Saul because he said, um, the Brother Paul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came. So the Lord revealed, because Ananias wasn't there, okay, the Lord revealed to um, Ananias that this man Saul was on his way and that, that he would have this amazing encounter. So there's a confirmation that the Lord appeared to the man Saul. And then we see he's going to lay hands on him. He's going to regain his sight. And that he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because remember, Paul or Saul wasn't there in Acts chapter 2 when it was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He came by a little bit later on. I will just now give you a little bit of timeline about his age and more or less when he was born. Um, so he laid hands on him, he obeyed the Lord Jesus, something like scales fell from his eyes, he regained his sight, and he was filled with the Spirit, and very beautifully um, he rose, and, and Luke records that after that he was baptized. Ticking the box, ticking the box, ticking the box, in a sense. He was healed physically, he was healed spiritually, he regained his sight, um, a new, complete new man, and then he went and he was baptized by the early church, by Ananias, and probably the other people in the church. And that is where, where Paul would write later on in Romans chapter 6 and would say, this is a conf yeah, an outward something of an inward changing of hearts. Dying with Jesus Christ, coming up in, a, in, in, in that symbolic way as a new person. And if you want to see a new person, well, Luke is describing it beautifully here in Acts chapter 9 about uh, Saul and how, um, how things changed right in his life. Then we will see um, a, a bit later on in the text, it says, for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately, now it doesn't say two to three years, okay, it says for some days. Now I don't know, we can't say with certainty whether it was a month or a few weeks or maybe a month or two, it's not, not sure, but Luke would probably, Luke wrote from some of the best Greek in the New Testament, Luke would tell us if it was three years or some years or something. So it wasn't that long period. And in verse 20, um, Luke says, And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. Church, this is beautiful. This is our Lord Jesus at work in the life of someone persecuting the church. So, if you see someone out there really not liking the church, that man, or woman for that matter, might become a significant missionary or leader or worship leader or someone um, like that. That is, that is beautiful. That so quickly he went to receive letters from the high priest to persecute the church. And very soon after his salvation, his encounter with the living Jesus Christ, he proclaimed with his mouth, saying, he is the Son of God. Okay, Remember, Paul believed in God, but not in Jesus Christ. So he learned from disciples. He confessed his faith in Jesus Christ, and he proclaimed it. Not there among the people in the churches. He went to the Jews in the synagogues, and he reasoned with them, as we will see right now. What does it mean when, when Luke writes and he says, Paul proclaimed that Jesus is the Son of God? It means that he explained that Jesus, the man from Nazareth, who was executed by crucifixion during the Passover about two to three years earlier, had been raised from the dead, 
that he had been exalted into the light of God's glorious presence. We had seen him while traveling um, to Damascus in order to arrest his followers. And that he is the son of God. A complete change in his heart. A complete change in his purpose. Now, uh, if you've got a study Bible or some other resources, you can go and do some, a little bit of um, um, yeah, a study yourself. Um, just quite interesting to note, Paul was born in the year 5 or 10 AD. That means just about 5 or 10 years after Jesus was born. Um, and Jesus was born actually what year? What year AD? How, when was Jesus crucified? How many? 32, 33, 35. Okay, well, the, 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 um, my uh, um, ESV study Bible says he was probably, um, con well, Jesus died in either 30 or 33 AD. If you want some reading on this, I'm not going to go into much detail about it. You can, you're welcome. I can give you some um, um, material that you can study. But Jesus was either crucified in the year 30 or 33 AD. And uh, Paul was converted in either 33 or 34 AD, or um, other resources say in 31 or 32. Now, there's a little bit of something that you can go and research and something um, interesting to chew on, but that doesn't change the fact whether it's 31 or 32 AD. That doesn't change the fact in terms of what happened in his life. What is well interesting is that you would see he was relatively young still. He wasn't, he wasn't 40, 50, 60 years old at that stage. He was probably in his 20s, early 20s, more or less, um, at that stage. Then when we continue in verse 21, Luke says, And all who heard him were amazed. All of him who heard, who heard him speak, saying, Jesus is the Son of God, was amazed. Now, I know in my own life that uh, there were friends or family that said after my conversion, what's happening here? I'm also amazed. What's happening in this guy's life? And I believe for many of you it's similar. Hopefully, or I trust for all of you it's similar. Because none of us were born Christians and been filled with the Spirit of the Lord. There was a time and a moment where we also had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, where we were filled with the Spirit. And yes, this year we've baptized people, saying uh, or having a testimony of, of proclaiming that my life has changed, that the Lord Jesus has done something amazing in my life. And here we see Luke recording, the people were amazed. Is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priest? Now he's confessing and he's proclaiming and he's saying that Jesus is the Son of God. What happened here? Complete transformation. And that's why we worship the Lord. From a sinner to a saint. Isn't that beautiful? From light or from darkness to light. From the kingdom of darkness or Satan to the kingdom of God. And this is a beautiful um, story that we have here. In a similar manner, Luke also wrote the gospel. And uh, in Luke chapter 4, just for interesting sake, um, you know, in Luke chapter 4, verse 22, the people say the same thing about Jesus. Is this not, this, is this not Joseph's son? Why? How is it possible that Jesus is speaking this language and speaking with this authority? Okay? And in the same way, we see um, with Saul people were really, really amazed. Then when we um, go to verse 22, Luke says, But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Okay, It wasn't just something he said, guys, Jesus is the Son of God. He's got proof. He knows the Old Testament better than probably any of us here, right now, he studied it. He was taught by a good teacher, Gamaliel, and now he's connecting the dots because of that light that shined into his heart, the revelation. This man who said, Lord, who are you? To confessing that Jesus is the Christ. Now, uh, um, Luan, there's a slide that would say, yes, the value of exegesis, you are following my thoughts. 
Now, Werner spoke about hermeneutics this morning, and I didn't know he's going to say that. But uh, I actually, because it's significant, and we can, we'll speak about that in future, that we do a little bit more studies. Now, in the English language, when we read, I'm reading from the ESV, that's um, the, the translation that I would say most of our church family often uses, the English Standard Version. In verse 22, it says, But Saul increased all the more in strength. So what would strength refer to? Well, my, the first thing that comes to my mind is he fasted for three days, he didn't eat or drank anything, so he was probably weak, okay? And he increased a bit the more in strength. Now, if you go and read a little bit more, and that's, that's, that's of definitely of value from time to time, I guess, the verb translated grew stronger may refer to Saul regaining his physical strength, because, as we said, he was fasting for three days, etc. But most interpreters and many translators follow a manuscript from the 5th century that adds, after grew stronger the faith in the word, thus re relating Saul's increasing strength also to his preaching. So he was probably increasing in strength in terms of his physical um, abilities, you know, just getting nutrients again in his body, but also in terms of his preaching. The expression could refer to both Saul's physical recovery and to his increasing confidence and ability of proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah. And just an interesting um, comparison I would make, as I said, in the ESV it says, but Saul increased all the more in strength. If you take out your Afrikaans Bible, the 1983 Bible, I can go and and that said also, Marsaulus het al hoe krachtiger gepreek. Okay? So the Afrikaans goes with that, um, with that way of saying Saul actually preached more powerfully. Saul, Saulus het al hoe krachtiger gepreek. Okay? So that, why it will, for some of you, it will probably not be the main discussion around coffee just now, but it's just a bit of encouraging. Go and do your homework. Go and dig a bit deeper. You will be rewarded. And as we see then in verse 22, um, he was proving with scripture that Jesus is the Christ. So the significance of Acts chapter 9 recorded in the New Testament written by Luke for us as the church today is to see the radical transformation in the life of this man called Saul. The Jesus that he thought was dead was certainly not dead. Okay? He knew about the crucifixion, um, but he did not know that Jesus Christ was alive. And not only was he not dead, but he was the living Lord of the universe, the exalted one, as we read in Colossians chapter 1. Who wrote Colossians? Paul wrote it. He's got this revelation. It flows from his mouth as living waters as he's inspired by the Spirit. Jesus was able to make this light shine. Jesus was alive. So on this road to Damascus, Paul's whole worldview collapsed. Everything that he believed in a sense was turned upside down. He thought Jesus is dead. He thought Jesus preaching the Jesus and everything about Jesus was heresy. Heresy is false teaching. That is why he felt compelled to go to the high priest, to get the letters, to put these evil people, in a sense, the followers of the way or Christians, to put them in, in jail because they are defiling the Jewish culture. They are preaching heresy. And here in Acts chapter 9, Paul's worldview collapses crashes in every possible way. Those letters from the high priest become useless. It's something that he probably threw away or burned. His purpose for leaving Jerusalem for Damascus fades because he doesn't... Um, what, isn't it beautiful the way that when Ananias lays hands on him, he says, Brother Saul, it's already... You are welcomed into the kingdom, into the family of God, into God's household. Saul had good theology before this happened. 
But now his theology changed. Just as Werner said, now he starts to look through the lens of Jesus Christ to everything. And his mind and his heart is now enlightened. He's filled with the Spirit. And his eyes is opened. And now he can see everything in the old is pointing to the new. The new in Christ. His heart is changed. Ananias became a brother to Saul. And Saul became a brother to Jesus. Uh, uh, not to Jesus, um, to Paul. They became family. This man when Ananias recognized the voice of Jesus, said, Lord, I, I'm afraid of this man. I'm afraid of him. I've heard about him. And now they become brothers. They, they stay together. Ananias was there when he was filled with the Spirit. Ananias was there when he was baptized. And Ananias was probably some of, one of those that, that taught him and testified about what Jesus was doing. Isn't that amazing? And his whole worldview was rebuilt on the solid, solid foundation of the ministry or the life of Jesus Christ, the testimony of who Jesus is, the truth about Jesus Christ. And we can see here there's, there's definitely um, something that the last words that we see bef in, in, in the old soul speaking was, Lord, who are you? Who are you? I can, someone's speaking to me, but, but I'm not sure. And the first words after his, let's call it his salvation, after we can see Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that is just so significant. And one of the reasons why it was significant, I, as I said and started off this morning, I said I had the privilege, and I really feel it is just a privilege to sit at the feet of a teacher like Corne Baker last week, and something that is ingrained in my heart, something that is said often, is the church needs a bigger revelation of who Jesus is. We shouldn't speak too much and try and define who we are. We should look more at who Jesus is. And when we look at Acts chapter 9, it's a beautiful example of a person who said, Lord, who are you? To a person who says, you are the Son of God. Isn't that just amazing? Isn't that just beautiful that he could prove later on with scriptures and say to the people, Jesus is Lord. And uh, how his life has changed in every way. I'm ending off this morning with two brief statements um, about theology. And that might be something that I think we can, uh, we can have a look at for the future as well. Um, I just want to read it to you. Because that's not something that happens in isolation. It's something we as the church sang together this morning what we believe. But there's also a place where we together with our singing and our reading and our proclaiming need to clarify what we believe. Okay, so let me read to you briefly and, and, and I'll end off there. The first one... Um, one you can go to just where it starts with a precise and robust definition of theology. There you go. Thank you. A precise and robust definition of theology is given by Jaroslav Pelikan, who regarded theology. Now, this is, by the way, from a book that uh, Kornay Becker um, prescribed and said we could read, so I believe it's a credible resource. What the Church of Jesus believes, teaches, and confesses on the basis of the word of God. This is Christian doctrine. To put things simply, theology is the study of God. It comes from the word theos, which in Greek, which is Greek for God, and from the word logos, um, which is Greek, which is, uh, let me repeat that, um, which is Greek for the word. Theology, the study of God. Okay, so... When we ask someone, who is Jesus in our society? Well, we might get a lot of answers. But when we look at Scripture, there's some clear-cut things that the Word of God teaches us on the life and the person and the deity of Jesus Christ. Let, um, and then, Luan, you can go to the next one. Um, I just want to read that to you. Um, um, yeah. Theology is studied and performed in a community of faith. Now, we are a community of faith. Um, 
Theology is something that is learned, lived, sung, preached, and renewed through the dynamic interaction between God and His people. Theology is the conversation that takes place between family members in the household of faith about what it means to behold and believe in God. Isn't that beautiful, church? Isn't that encouraging that we should worship together, pray together, and as a household of faith, as a spiritual family, talk about the Lord Jesus Christ? I've told the story probably before, um, but I remember I had a friend that came to salvation about six months earlier than myself. And when, and yeah, we were all, both of us were, were very, very young, and we lived quite close to each other. And we started going to the same church, which was a Shafo Christian church in Stellenbosch back in the day. And we started to, to wrestle with different things about the Holy Spirit and, and baptism and missions and, and all different things. And we grew and we grew and we grew in our theology, in our understanding. And this morning, um, all of us will probably be in a slightly different place in terms of our understanding, in terms of our revelation of who Jesus Christ is. And one thing I can tell you today is that as the church, we are swimming in toxic waters. Okay? That's something that Corne, uh, Professor Becker made so, so clear. You know, there's the influence of liberalism and many other things. And all those things would, li would like to nullify Jesus or would like to make Jesus very small. And I was just sitting, um, now this is not quoted somewhere in scripture, I think, um, but I was just thinking during the past week, the bigger our revelation of who Jesus is, the smaller our problems becomes. Because in Colossians 1 it says that everything is held together in Jesus Christ. He is fully and completely and utterly in control of everything. It wasn't something that sold it. That changed his life. It was something that Jesus did in the life of Saul, calling him and sending him out again. So I want to encourage you, um, and I'll, I will pray for us, just, for us just now. If you read this um, Acts chapter 9 and go and read chapter 22 and 26 as well, and just be in awe of the transformation in the life of Paul and how it happened, how a man could say, who's speaking to very quickly, he is the Son of God, starting to proclaim, filled with the Spirit, being baptized. And then just this w little bit about theology this morning, what we believe, how we see things. Um, it's a conversation, a good and nice conversation, where we need to talk to each other about Scripture, about what we believe and how we believe it, and be transformed in that in many ways as well. So, Lord, this morning.